I think we are at risk in Canada of dying as an economy. And I will share with you some signs of what's happening. So this is not a matter of being nice to the new immigrants anymore. If we don't benefit from the diversity we have in this country, we are not going to be sustainable. It's as simple as that. And one of them, if, if you remember when we are told about tsunamis and the risk is that there is an earthquake somewhere and then the water from the shore recedes to feed the tidal wave. And if you are not prepared, and if you don't know that when the water disappears from the shore, a, a big wave is coming to kill you, you just go and take pictures and, and invite your friends to come and enjoy the fact that the, the, the beach is bigger. Okay? <laughs> and what's happening is that this thing, okay, you're going to be the first to die, basically. So look at this. Boom. December of last year. For the first time in history, our combined life expectancy in Canada went beyond the age of 80. So we as Canadians should expect to live for more than 80 years. But we still expect to retire at the age of 65, or some of us at 60, and some even think of 55. So now if you retire at 60, you're likely to have 20 more years ahead of you. Who's going to pay for you while you're retired? Okay. Well, traditionally, we rely on young people. So we reproduce and have a vibrant native-born workforce feeding the economy. In 20 years, seniors will represent more than 20% of the population. So how are we going to keep all this going? So, as I said traditionally, we expect to have a bunch of young people coming and feeding the workforce. Well, we are the victims of our success in a double way. So we are not only living longer because our conditions of life are great, well, we are reproducing less uh, as well because women have embraced uh, um, careers more. Now more, most students at university, for example, are women. Um, and they don't want to have as many kids. So I think Jesus and your mom is now uh, uh, quite uh, an unusual sight these days. So women in Canada are having 1.5 kids okay? uh, per each of them, which is a funny statistic. But we need 2.1 kids per woman to keep, you see, the population going. And we are at 1.5. So it's impossible to keep those people who are living longer with the rate at which we are reproducing. So, so we need to rely on, on, on fresh blood. So we are one of the countries in the world that have welcomed uh, most uh, 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 immigrants from all over the world. We are perceived as a world within a country, and we still have a good reputation worldwide. But the key word is still, because I don't think we deserve it. So data from the 2001 census shows that we have, or show that we have now, the same number of newcomers as we had as the entire population of Canada in 1900. 47% of people in Canada now have a background other than British, French, or First Nations. One out of two people. The country has changed dramatically. 41% of immigrants in the 90s had a university degree. Twice this, the rate of people who were born in Canada. So we are attracting highly qualified people here. Some of us believe that we are feeding the brain drain from other countries that cannot afford to have a brain drain. The sad part is that people with university degrees in Canada who are recent immigrants are overrepresented amongst those who hold low-skilled jobs. So we have more drivers, more porters, more janitors with university degrees than we should have given the distribution of university degrees in the population at large. And suddenly, what people feel when they come is that they were offered the landed immigrant visa, which in theory gives you the same rights as a citizen except the right to vote. And that was given to you by the federal government. When you come and try to find a job, then you realize that jobs are mostly managed by provincial agencies. 
and they don't talk to each other, the feds and the, and, and the provincial leaders. So you're caught in the middle. But look at what we're doing to the next generation, to those who came roughly at the same time when I came with my kids. These are figures of child poverty in Canada. 2001 census. If you look, all children in Canada, this is shocking. 18% of kids are poor in Canada now. I, how could we tolerate that? If you have disability as a kid, you have, you're part of 27% of people who are poor. But if you're an immigrant, it goes up to 40%. And, and if your family migrated between 1996 and 2001, we have one of every two kids poor in this country, with parents who are likely more educated than the people that they found when they came here. I mean, this is tragic. So is it too late, is the question. What can we do? And some people think that it's too late already. This is data from The Economist last year, showing the biggest, econ the biggest uh, economies in the world. And Canada appears as the seventh larger economy, largest economy in the world when we measure that level of wealth by GDP. But when we show what we pay for what we get, okay, we disappear. So we are not on the top eight in the world anymore when we look at purchasing power parity, which means, you see, depending on your earning and your purchasing power. And by the year 2040, we are likely not to be anywhere. So we appear there in absolute numbers, but what things cost here for what we get, okay, is a different matter. Time Magazine had discovered a few years ago, asking whether anybody would notice if we disappeared. And I wonder sometimes if the world would notice if we disappeared as a country. And um, the indicators, I'm finishing now, Jane, show that we're not as strong as we think we are. When I came to Canada with my family in 1995, the country was first in the world in terms of human development index. This is why we bet. Now we are six. In 13 years, we went down five places. We are 12th in the world in terms of productivity at work. Norway, Sweden, and Iceland had four times greater in you see, productivity than we did. We are 14th in the world in terms of spending in education. We used to spend a lot before, now we have cut that. And our healthcare system is now ranked 30th. Even my Colombian health system is better now than the Canadian healthcare system. So, what are we going to do? We are the generation that can make the decisions that will change the direction in which we're moving. But if we don't do it, who will? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Really appreciate your, your words. I think it's a challenge to us to look at, so how do we play a part to make sure that we are part of the solution? Because we do strongly believe here that immigrants are part of the solution for building a stronger Canada. Please join me in thanking Alison for those very inspiring words. <laughs>